Good afternoon, dear colleagues. It's my pleasure to welcome to welcome you to the third session of our third day of the Berlin Demography Days, which is dedicated to global issues. In this session, we are going to focus on younger people and the life course, and we are very privileged to count with an excellent uh, keynote, which will, and after the presentation, this will be followed by a response from our discussant. And after that, we will open to our panelists and to the general audience. Please feel free to post during all the time questions to the Q&A. And you'll read the question and post the questions to the, to the speakers. So uh, to start uh, the session, I would like to welcome our keynote, Dr. Nkechi Obo. She's senior lecturer at the Department of Economics at the University of Ghana. And please correct me if I spell your name incorrectly. Nikachi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to begin sharing my screen. I must warn that the connection here is a little tricky, but I have shared my slides, um, my presentation with you already. So if it gets too bad, you can go ahead and play the pre-recorded. Um, yes, present. absolutely. Okay. Um, so thank you again. I'm very pleased to be giving this keynote um, on the youth and the life course. Um, so this is the outline that my brief um, presentation will take. Um, so when we talk about the youth, um, usually we are referring to people um, according to the UN who are between um, 15 and 24 years of age. But it's important to recognize, as came up in an earlier keynote today, that different countries can have different um, ranges for who, who are defined as, as, as young people. So in the African Youth Charter, for example, young people are between 15 and 35 years of age. Now we have about 1.2 billion young people on Earth, and they make up about 16% of the global population. I want to highlight that majority of the youth um, is currently found in places like Asia and then Sub-Saharan Africa. And according to the UN, the population of the youth is projected to increase by as much as 62% by 2050, with the largest increases um, observed in Africa. So we have a sense of where um, quite a bit of focus will be, if, if it already isn't, um, or will be also going into um, the future. Now, the adoption of a live course approach, I think, is, is really useful because it helps us to understand, you know, the pathways um, that the youth pass through all the way from childhood that influences their behaviors um, into adolescence, their youth stage, and even into adult, adulthood. Now, development, as we know, is lifelong. It would be difficult, if not impossible, to understand any one stage in isolation um, from others. Now, as has also come up in earlier keynotes, transitions um, by young people from the childhood stage, where they are um, almost completely um, dependent on their parents, um, into the, the youth stage can be difficult, where they are if not fully autonomous, but at least partially autonomous. And we have seen certain events um, like you know, climate change, the depletion of natural resources, um, rapid advances in technologies, and even the recent COVID-19 pandemic, um, which have served to further increase these um, difficulties associated with transitions um, into the youth stage. Um, it's therefore important to try to identify the challenges and vulnerabilities that the youth face uh, because it would be useful in the design of um, appropriate policies and also um, youth strategies that would go towards um, um, affecting um, uh, the youth, uh, youth outcomes. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the vulnerabilities just generally um, that young people experience um, and that have um, important consequences for their long-term um, development. So I'll touch on poverty and nutrition, education, unemployment, the role of social and cultural norms, and also talk a bit about political conflict. Now, as we know, in resource-poor settings, um, access to healthy and nutritious food is limited. 
According to the UN, close to 500 million people in Africa are currently living below the international poverty line. And this is a situation that has been further exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, where we saw an additional 97 million people being pushed into extreme poverty um, worldwide. Now, the link between poverty and nutrition is already well established. And we are also seeing increasing in, um, evidence that poor nutrition at the childhood stage is linked with long-term um, adverse consequences. And this can comprise things like um, lower disease immunity, poorer cognitive functioning and learning abilities, which have implications for later labor market productivity and earnings capabilities. I'd also like to talk about the role of education and formal training as a potential source um, of youth and vulnerability. So we are, it's, it's really comforting to see that we are, there's increasingly um, a more focus on education and formal training, um, especially at the basic level, when you look at what's happening in developing countries. Um, however, there are a few threats to this education agenda that we must be aware of. So I've already talked about poverty as it relates to nutrition, but it also plays a very important role in access of children and young people to education. So even though at the basic level, we see more government intervention, when we talk about secondary levels of education and even higher education, like at the tertiary stages, as a result of low income status of a lot of households, young people are finding it more and more difficult to access education at these higher levels with implications for their um, labor market um, engagement. We can also talk about cultural norms and gender stereotypes as um, one of the, the, the threats to the education agenda. And so in many settings, um, education of um, the girl child is, is, is actively discouraged for the reason that um, too much education could make young girls unsuitable for the marriage market because it makes them diff more difficult to try to control in a household setting. Um, culture also prescribes men in many developing country settings as the major breadwinners of their households. And therefore there's little incentive, is it, it is argued, um, for women to be educated and work because men will already provide for the households. And yet we also see literature that suggests that women who are not properly educated um, have, have uh, uh, limited labor market engagement. And also it has implications for their empowerment and associated um, effects. Um, the presence of conflicts are another threat to the education agenda and through a number of different channels, and I'll touch on one or two of them. So in areas where we see um, uh, conflicts occurring, children who could be going to school, young people who could be um, um, uh, furthering their education, oftentimes can be enlisted to serve as soldiers. We also see that the targeting of schools and teachers, students also tends to reduce um, school attendance and um, with implications for um, um, development outcomes later on in life. Um, so we can also talk about unemployment, underemployment as sources of youth vulnerability. So as already been um, discussed um, extensively throughout this con conference, um, we see that the school to work um, transitions have not been playing out very smoothly. We tend to see high um, rates of unemployment and underemployment in many parts of the world. Um, according to the World Bank statistics, um, youth unemployment globally is about 17%, but it tends to vary. Okay, so in places like Germany, it's as low as 70%, but it can go up to as high as 60% in a country like South Africa. And the situation is so dire that this crop of youth has been referred to as generation jobless. Now, why do we see these high rates of unemployment? So some people have suggested that it's because of the mismatch um, between the education that young people are receiving and what industry um, is, is demonstrating that it needs. Um, we also see that um, a poor structural transformation in many of these developing country settings and the associated uh, low or limited creation of productive opportunities may also be explaining that gap um, between the number of people who are seeking jobs and then the available positions. 
Um, so even in settings where we find young people are working, more often than, than not, they're involved in vulnerable areas of employment and also in the informal low productivity se sectors of um, the economy. Now we care about this situation because high levels of unemployment have implications both at the national and then at the individual level. At the national level, it has implications for the demographic dividend and um, economic growth of a country. And then at the individual level, we also see that young people who are not able to be gainfully employed report um, negative um, implications for their mental health and they also have lower self-esteem. Um, young men who are not working and therefore not making an income may also find it difficult to get married and start their families, therefore delaying their social um, integration into society or into their various communities. And we also have had situations where individuals or young people who are not gainfully um, employed tend to a life of crime and they are involved in violent activities, in some cases as a means of survival. Now, I also want to talk about the role of social norms um, in contributing to youth vulnerabilities. Um, and in many cases, the effects of these norms can be gendered. I was very pleased to see in the, in the earlier presentation by Shireen, where she talked a lot about the incidence of early child marriages in India. Now, in some parts of Africa, it can be as high as 80% um, among, among young girls. And we know that the implication of early marriages is that it can derail education and other studies have shown that it can also encourage um, higher incidences of intimate partner um, violence. Now with early marriage often comes early childbirth. There are a lot of studies that have implied or have shown that um, there are negative consequences with respect to health for young mothers and their children when childbirth occurs at very um, young ages. We also have the, um, uh, the practice of female circumcision or female genital mutilation, which is hailed in um, many cultural settings as a positive thing um, because it keeps young girls um, chaste until marriage. And there are other arguments uh, that have been um, given in, in favor of this practice, but we know and the research has shown that this can have um, this practice which takes place among children um, younger than 15 years of age um, can have severe physical, sexual and emotional repercussions later on in life. And um, data from UNICEF shows that this practice can go can be as high as 90% um, of all girls who have undergone this um, practice in some countries in Africa. I want to talk um, also about uh, political conflicts um, as a source of youth um, vulnerabilities. Now, a lot of the studies um, that we see have looked at the effects of political and violent conflicts on youth in the period immediately after the conflict. We don't see a lot of um, studies that have followed the youth to see how these um, violence um, experiences have, have affected their developmental outcomes into the long term. But we do have some ideas of the potential consequences. So for example, um, during political conflicts, the associated displacement, um, the reduced access to basic resources like social amenities, healthcare, and the destruction of social networks and the subsequent loss of social support systems and other factors can pose a threat to the safety and security of young people. A young people may also have reduced incentives to invest um, in established routes like education and employment during periods of instability, um, like when we are seeing political and or violent conflicts happen within, within a setting. And finally, young people could also adopt risky behaviors um, as a result of their exposure to these um, violent um, experiences. Now, um, it is comforting to, to state that there are indications of um, a growing political will to try to address issues that are of importance to the youth. We do see some country specific strategies. In Ethiopia, for example, um, there is a youth policy that is aimed at empowering young people to participate in global um, uh, um, um, production processes. In Ghana and Kenya, we have youth policies that focus on education and skills training among young people. And in Zambia, the focus is on entrepreneurship. 
So life course approach again is critical so that we can see early interventions, um, uh, early um, administrations of these interventions. So we hope that it will um, uh, properly impact the youth as they go through their developmental stages. So I've talked about the fact that some of these interventions or strategies can take place at the country level, but we do have some global um, uh, strategies as well. Um, and I'd like to um, touch just briefly on the UN's youth strategy known as Youth 2030. And so um, in 2020, for example, we know that the youth experienced um, some adverse outcomes on a wide range of, um, of situations. So for example, a lot of young people lost access to um, in-person learning. Um, a lot of young people also lost their jobs or were pushed into more precarious um, working conditions. We know that the mental health of, a health of a lot of children and young people also deteriorated. And young women were also affected because they saw an increased burden of care work they also lost their economic um, opportunities and as already came out in an earlier keynote, they were also at higher risks of experiencing violence. So the Youth 2030, even though launched in 2018, was particularly focused around the, on the youth around the COVID-19, um, 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 the start of the COVID-19 pandemic because it tried to provide support to countries with a focus on developing youth-led solutions. So um, despite, as I said, the, the seeming political will to try to address issues of importance to the youth, a lot of youth programs that have been begun haven't been entirely successful for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, there's not as much information about the youth um, that would be necessary for the design of appropriate um, policies. We also tend to see weak coordination among government agencies, donors, and then regional organizations. We also see a failure to design policies that are sufficiently nuanced, given that youth's experiences can vary by their gender, their location, um, the, the status of their household wealth, and even disability. And therefore, it would be important that policies be properly targeted, but not just that, also properly uh, implemented and then um, uh, monitored to make sure that they would actually make a difference um, in the life of the youth. So to conclude, I think a, a study and um, understanding of the youth would be better informed, certainly when located within the life course, because it gives us an idea of early processes that the youth have been exposed to and helps to, um, to be better informed about later potential later development outcomes. I must say that in a developing country context, it would be useful to have a, a lot more longitudinal data sets, um, just so it's better to identify some of the mechanisms of continuity and discontinuity um, among um, children, youth, and adults, and, and, and adults as they go through that um, transition. Currently, we don't have, um, we don't see a lot of that, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. We do have some like the Young Lives data, which focuses on, I think, four or five countries, but we do need to see a lot more um, longitudinal data to help us to better appreciate um, outcomes of the youth from a um, life course perspective. Um, the access to mixed methods research would also be useful because then we can combine the quantitative information we are seeing with qualitative data to properly understand some of the underlying reasons for youth choices um, and how the youth are also affected by different experiences and even by different policies and interventions. Um, thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to the ensuing discussion. Thank you so much Nkechi for this excellent outstanding presentation. I have learned a lot and it provokes lots of questions which I hope we'll have the time to discuss afterwards. Now I would like to invite our discussant Professor Joyce Melo Vieira she is professor at the Department of Demography at the Universidade Estadual de Campinas in Brazil. Joyce, it's a pleasure to have you here. Also, my mm -hmm. dear friend, and I would like to hear from you your insights on the presentation, but also in the context of Brazil. Thank you, Daniela. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks to the organizers for the invitation. Thanks to Dr. Niketi for her presentation and analysis. I agree with your vision about the principal current vulnerabilities affecting the young population. And I want to highlight some Latin American challenges now. Uh, probably these questions are not exclusive to our region, 
but in the is the main focus of attention between us. Uh, sometimes the idea of a demographic bonus sounds like a false promise here, uh, because sometimes the argument is not well understood by policymakers, and we see a reduction in the investment in the young population. Access to formal education is much better today, but the returns of education are not the same compared to 15 or 20 years ago. The unemployment is higher, despite the superior education, educational level of the young generation. Here in Brazil, we need a deep reform of the high school, essentially. Uh, the objective is to turn the school closer to the labor market and uh, stimulate entrepreneurship. But honestly, yeah, I am not sure what exactly entrepreneurship is. What we are seeing is the uberization of the labor market. The idea of you make your time work means typically to work 10 or 12 hours per day. The idea of you do not have a boss normally means working without benefits or security. And the uberization in different kinds of services many times is just a actualization of the informal labor market historically so strong in Latin America in general and in Brazil particularly. And this movement is associated with a more structural problem, the, the industrialization of many regions, many regions in the world. Uh, training and education are essential, but we need to discuss the productive structure seriously and regional development connected programs for the young population. If we do not do it, we push more and more people for international immigration because people do not find any space for more creative activities with a uh, human dimension. Uh, the economy is suffering in the, in the industrialization before turning our countries truly industrialized, and the population is turning old before turning rich. Uh, the pandemic just accentuated the situation a part of the young population change is short and medium term plans because of the pandemic. Some of them become the reference person for the siblings and younger relatives after the grandparents or parents passed away. Even not being directly affected by the, the high mortality record in the period, others were impacted by the economic downturn, downturn, downturn uh, that affected their families and mainly the unequal access to remote learning. Therefore, one, one of Brazilians' main challenges is the guarantee the permanence and engagement of students in the education system, and in this moment exactly. Uh, the scenario requires intersectional policies that consider the family and community environments and which adolescents and young people live. In our case, we need more investment in longitudinal data, but maybe more than it, we need political decisions based in evidence. A significant part of the problem in societies very polarized, like the mine now, is that ideology comes first over any science or evidence. But I am a little bit optimist anyway. In the last years, the student movements are making more active again, and we have good networks between universities and schools. This relation university school is not trivial or minor. An important strategy for scientists and universities is the diffusion, diffusion of technology directly into communities of workers in urban and rural, rural areas in activities of uh, university extension. Thanks for your attention. I'm sorry, I wasn't on mute. Thank you so much, Joyce, for the very, very nice comments. Uh, which is very enriching for this discussion. I would like, before we invite our panelists, if Niketi would like to, to share ideas on the comments. Um, so I, I, I wonder if it was from my end, I couldn't um, hear the comments too clearly, but from the little that I heard, 
um, I understood that um, Joyce was drawing some parallels um, between um, some of um, um, what I have presented and the situation as it exists um, in Brazil. So I, 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 was, I was agreeing with a lot of what she was saying that I heard. She, talk, she talked about difficulties um, with respect to the working situations of young people and many of these situations that we also face um, in sub-Saharan Africa. She talked about the fact that they are oftentimes engaged in you know, the informal sector with um, um, indecent working conditions, low productivity. Those are things that certainly um, tend to, be, to uh, be common also in my part of the world. She talked about difficulties with respect to um, access to education, quality education. She also talked about the effects of the pandemic on young people. So um, I cannot disagree um, with um, what she was saying. I think that there are um, issues that we also face um, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I think that a lot more developing economies would uh, are also currently grappling with. So I, I certainly am appreciative of those, of those comments. So thank you very much, Joyce. Joyce, would you please turn on your camera so we can, can see you? And now I would like to invite Dominique Kirchdorfer. Are you there, Dominique? To I am comment. Do Dominique is Managing Director of the European Future Forum and is based in Vienna in Austria. Dominique, you heard many different uh, uh, stories from what we have here in Europe, but it's also, I, as I believe, I don't know you, I would like to hear from you, there are also lots of commonalities. So I would like to get your reactions to the two, the two presentations. So first of all, sorry if you hear this in the background, there's a lot of work going on in my building at the moment. I, I oh. apologize, it's out of my control. Um, so I wasn't also able to, to hear everything that was being said too clearly, but uh, I've got the gist of it. And as you were saying, Kechi, uh, have difficulties disagreeing with anything, but then we don't necessarily have to disagree. Uh, however, I'd like to, to, to throw in a, a uh, slightly different perspective maybe as well, since we're talking about the life course perspective. Uh, and I also associate this with lifelong learning, which is uh, something I'm very passionate about. Uh, because we talk these, these uh, demographic days, we've talked a lot about the youth and, and young people uh, and how early child development in particular, early uh, cycles of education, formal education in particular, uh, have a significant impact on the later stages in life. So even if lifelong learning opportunities might uh, be available, they might not participate or partake because they might not see the value because of different social norms and other environmental factors that they've been exposed to early on. Now, the problem uh, that I see, particularly, and this is my kind of uh, uh, little point here, is I, I was looking for this earlier. I found, well, maybe you can't see it here now because of my virtual background, but I have a lovely book here called World Class, uh, How to Build a 21st Century School System, which was published by the OECD. It was written by Andreas Schleicher, the director for education and skills of the OECD, in which he describes how we need to uh, change our educational system to be fit for purpose for uh, our century, mainly because we haven't updated our education system, at least in Europe, for the last 200 years. And it's simply no longer fit for purpose. And we're still being educated uh, by our parents and also by our, our school teachers to think that if we just go through formal education, if we just uh, go through school and potentially university, that's enough to be prepared for the rest of our lives. And that's simply not true. Uh, now, my biggest concern is that we keep talking about the youth and all we do is talk and we never implement anything. And uh, changing systems can be hard and it can be uh, time consuming. And our main uh, problem here is the increasing instability of our democratic societies and how very little incentive there is for politicians as well to change educational systems. Because first of all, uh, parents are very much uh, more uh, likely to be in favor of having their children educated the way that they have been educated rather than learning something new that they are unfamiliar with which means that there's not exactly an incentive for politicians to 
uh, change educational systems if they want to be voted in uh, on in, during the next elections. And then the other factor is simply that even if there was a politician brave enough to actually try and attempt in a, a reform of the educational system, which has happened many, many times in, in Austria before, by the time that something like that is actually implemented, the current youth will no longer be young. So right now I'm 30 years old. If I look back to 10, 10 years ago when I started engaging with politics and trying to, to make a difference in, in this area, within 10 years it's taken me this long to just get to the point where I'm right now where I might have a modicum of influence on policy making and if I look at uh, that period of 10 years in which I've been engaging with uh, politics and civil society within those 10 years in my country we've had eight governments and even more educational ministers how on earth is anyone ever supposed to change any kind of system and prepare us for the digital revolution that we're facing now with everything that's coming along with it including labor market shifts on, on and complete loss and gain of old and new professions if we're not even able to sustain a government for that long so that's just a little impulse i wanted to give for the discussion thank you so much dominic this is very very relevant and I remember when I, I, I had two years of postdoctoral uh, as postdoctoral researcher with colleagues uh, studying educational systems, and uh, I was also very impressed by first the, the the difficulty to change things, and but also on the other hand, how easy it is to make random decisions and uh, changes without any scientific base. So. There's lots of uh, political decisions that are not evidence-based in the field of education. And this is uh, really, uh, it's really happening everywhere. So uh, Nkechi, would you like to respond to that? Um, yes, um, thank you very much, uh, Dominique. Um, so um, the very first um, point he talked about was the importance of um, lifelong learning. And he also talked about, um, I think, the need for a change um, in the educational system, I think, to make um, uh, the young people more ready um, to, go into, to go into the workplace. Um, so I want to say that I would agree with him because even I want to use the situation um, of my country, Ghana. I mean, we have uh, an educational system that we say tends to prepare us more for entry into you know um uh, formal work so to speak um but then we we don't see a lot of these um uh, job openings you know in the formal sector so when we have a situation where a lot of the um uh, system is 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 geared towards that type of preparation well then we'll see people leave school be educated, but find it difficult to, to have gainful employment. Um, so this is um, one reason why um, we see also in Ghana a number of different programs aimed at sort of pushing this technical and vocational training agenda. So that once people you know, leave school, perhaps they have some um, skills that they can use to set themselves up in business and then have something to do since we simply don't have the capacity to employ everybody in the formal sector. I want to say that even though um, this is something that I find to be more prevalent in more developed economies, I think that another thing that we are missing um, in um, developing country settings, also in Ghana, is that um, elements of counseling, okay, career counseling. So we realize that a lot of young people oftentimes go into particular fields of study, not really understanding what it entails, what the later job implications are. We simply don't have um, access to that level of, of information. So young people, for example, um, perhaps may find it more beneficial to go into one job category versus another, but without adequate information on what to do, or what courses to take, what careers to choose, we have situations where in some, some uh, fields of work, we see a death of potential or a scarcity of young people. And then in others, we see you know, a concentration of young people with, again, limited opportunities for 
for, for employment. So I would agree. And then just um, a last um, point on that is that even with respect to uh, specialized training, okay, because um, oil and gas, for example, mining, um, jobs in the mining sector, we don't tend to see a lot of, you know, young people uh, in these areas, well, because they don't have these specialized skills, um, because it's simply not being given, you know, starting off from early stages, um, and then it's more likely to be uh, given, you know, during specialized courses and all that. And if you're a young person who doesn't have access um, to funds, as I talked about, well, then this is, you know, well beyond your reach. So I think certainly um, specialized um, education would also be important. Um, so another thing Dominic talked about was um, sort of uh, a, 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 a lack of a desire or incentives for um, policymakers to try to change up the educational system. So in Ghana, I think um, the situation is a little different because we have had a lot of tweaks and adjustments to our educational system. <laughs> so um, in some cases, I think that it's well motivated. So in one instance, there was the proposition to um, expand the duration of secondary education, just so you know, the belief is young people stay in school longer, they gain more skills, they are you know, better educated and so on. Um, but in some cases also, um, these have not played out um, too well. We have had a scenario where you know, the course curricula has actually, there has been attempts to change this. But of course, we need to see the follow through. When you change the course curricula, well, then the textbooks have to come. You see, we have to have people who are trained in this new curricula. Otherwise, you have seen a change to the system. Yes, policymakers are reacting and responding to, that, to these challenges with respect to education, but there has to be a follow through. Otherwise, we don't see the, the, the long-term benefits. Um, in Ghana also, as I mentioned, um, we have supports for education at the basic level. And in recent times, uh, we have also seen support at the senior, um, uh, the senior uh, level of, of education or senior secondary um, education, where everybody at that stage gets to go to school for free. You can, you can imagine the implications for otherwise poor households who would not be able to send their children to, for secondary education otherwise. But again, we are seeing challenges with the system because the sustainability of that program, um, unfortunately, has been called into question. So um, in Ghana, we do see um, a, a willingness to try to address some of these challenges, but there's not a lot of follow through. Um, maybe, um, I don't want to say maybe not because of political, um, a lack of political will, but perhaps, you know, um, it just hasn't been planned properly. So we haven't, we are so far, we're still waiting to see, you know, the, the benefits of some of these um, alterations that have been made. But I would agree with you, Dominique. I mean, a lot of um, the educational materials and uh, curricula that we're working with is very outdated. It doesn't respond, as you said, to these times where we're talking about digitization and all of that. So I would, I would agree. But of course, if if a, 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 an economy is going to go in that direction, it there has to be followed, it has to be planned properly so that it's sustainable and we can see the long-term benefits. Um, I hope I haven't spoken too much. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have two questions from the same person in the audience. Thank you, Anastasia Gage, for posting these questions. I'll jump to your second question first because it's related to the conversation I have now and that, but of course I'll come back to the first one, which is about the, the educational divide, the, the digital divide. So she's asking uh, on the conversation on life, like, lifelong learning and education, what about uh, improving school quality? Some are now arguing for a measure on learning adjusted years of schooling, because it's believed that young people in some parts of the world are going to school, but not learning. What are your thoughts about this issue? Can we ensure that young people are learning in schools? What are your thoughts, Joyce? So I, I think here the question is, um, what exactly is the reform uh, and what we are, we are teaching in, in the schools uh, because uh, 
we we I see here is um, we have four uh, minister of education in two years, and uh, we have a lot of discontinuity in the educational policy, and uh, the the movement is more again ideological inside the universe inside the schools uh, than properly. Uh, the focus in skills. And many times uh, the skills is more um, directed to, to marketing or, or um, uh, is not exactly technology or something that have more aggregate value or um, centered in more dynamic areas of economy. So uh, the discussion now is especially um, um, argument against uh, what they, they call it gender ideology. So some, some topics that uh, we are talking here, uh, we do not discuss inside the schools. And uh, uh, the problem is what will be exactly this reform? Uh, it's not clear uh, in, in, the, in this moment, uh, but I'm sure if, uh, if the reform, the, the folks will be the, the skills uh, and uh, more is centered in more dynamic areas of economy, I'm sure. All people will agree with this reform, but it's not exactly this that we happen now. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, Dominic, you raise your hand. Yes, because uh, I, I think the direction uh, of, of, of Joyce's response was, was absolutely in, in line with what I was saying earlier. Uh, so when I was mentioning uh, how many governments we had in 10 years, and that even if someone's brave enough to try a reform, everyone has completely different conceptions of what the reform should look like. So they end up experimenting with you know, new kinds of experimental final exams, for example, and, and, and these kind of things. And uh, the children ultimately end up paying the price for it. So I, I myself had, had to go through an experimental final exam uh, in, in when I was graduating high school, and they kept changing it every year ever since I graduated. So that is definitely an issue. So that there is a, a lack of long-term planning and vision in, in politics these days. But to also answer the, the question, if I may, uh, that was asked by Anastasia, uh, if government is unable to, to provide reform, uh, to some extent, it's then impossible to do something because uh, certain parts of the educational system are locked by, behind policy and, and law. Uh, however, there are other ways of going around it. Uh, so if it's possible to, to, to change the curriculum in one form or another, there have been experiments, there have been changes across, across the world and individualization, interdisciplinary practical uh, teaching, also with multiple teachers for one class, uh, specialized in different subjects, working together to bring a really holistic bird's eye view perspective and also hands-on uh, teaching style into classrooms has to be proven very, very effective because it not only transfers knowledge and we need to go away from transferring knowledge and towards transferring skills, particularly soft skills. That's uh, the key here. Uh, and if you look at different parts of the world, different, different uh, labor markets have also different solutions for a, a different things. In my country, what they told me when I graduated high school was, there's no entry level positions uh, for people like you. You have to leave, go, go abroad and, and, and get a job there, come back in a couple of years, we'll make you a manager. That was the advice I got from the job center. It was the advice I got from my university from everywhere. So that's the norm there. I'm not saying it's a good idea, but that's how it is. In the United Kingdom, where I did one of my degrees, uh, there's a culture there uh, for companies to take on uh, university graduates right after graduation. Usually they're very young, 21, 22 years old, sometimes even, even younger, and training them, training them on the job. So there have been, uh, I've seen many, many positions open over the years where young people would simply be 
uh, paid to be trained. So you have one year, maybe two years of on the job training when you're being paid. So you don't have to worry about, uh, about getting another job being paid to then be trained to specifically fulfill the roles that you're needed to, to fulfill. And then after that, you're, you're officially hired with a higher salary and you go on to work. So this kind of uh, private partnership or maybe even a private public partnership could be the key to, to really helping to ensure that the formal education is complemented uh, with on the job training. And we have to also look at, uh, if we're talking about lifelong learning, about executive education, which used to be a thing and is uh, the trend is going towards uh, less and less of support for edu uh, executive education. So if you're in, in your 30s, for example, like I am right now, it's very, very difficult to get support for executive education from any kind of company because of the way that labor markets have evolved and companies are now distrustful of their employees, which is a very bad uh, tendency. And they do not trust that employees will actually hold up their end of the bargain if they help them, whether it is through time off or financing uh, their uh, executive education or part-time education while they're working there. Because they think that as soon as they've gotten this benefit, employees will jump ship. So this is another part where, on the one hand, we need to work on company leadership and how companies really uh, understand their employees and their needs and, and how to really keep them and to get them to actually want to keep their employees rather than saying, well, we'll just hire another person then uh, instead. Uh, and on the other hand, we could also use private-public partnerships here by having governments incentivize uh, companies to further help uh, their employees to get uh, executive education or part-time education while, while working. So as I see it, pr private-public par uh, partnerships are, are the way to go. But then, of course, it depends on the attitude of your current government, right? Because most of the time, even if you have scholarships or any kind of other financial incentives for people to uh, get education it's usually a one-time thing if you have already had uh, one kind of degree or a diploma or any kind of uh, training whether it's formal or informal and you've uh, been awarded any kind of uh, award by an institution then it's usually uh, capped off because of course to some extent th that makes sense because you want more people to be able to to go into the pool and not always the same person to get an award but at the same time it shows the kind of attitude that we have towards learning you've already learned once you're not allowed to learn again because it's no longer your turn and that i think is very dangerous and we need to get away from that very well said thank you so much dominique uh, i have a question here in the chat before we move to the final topic that i would like to discuss with you about uh Digital, um, about digital divide. Uh, there's a question here in the chat for Nikechi. Uh, the question is, um, you spoke about policies and programs that are geared towards specific aspects of young people. For example, you mentioned entrepreneurship programs in Zambia. I was wondering if you know of a country or countries that have a more comprehensive policy or policies that touches on multiple aspects of the vulnerabilities of young people. This question is coming from Monica Lambon. Monica Lambon. Thank you, Monica, for the question. All right, thank you very much for your question, um, Monica. Um, hmm. So I would say that, well, I wouldn't call it necessarily a comprehensive strategy. But we do have countries like in mine, for example, Ghana, that have um, different interventions um, that can have either direct or indirect um, implications for the youth. So I already talked about the um, senior high school education, which is now free and is meant to encourage um, or increase uh, the uptake of education for young people at this level where before a lot of them were excluded because they could not afford to attend this level of education. I already talked about the technical and vocational training initiatives that um, the government has rolled out. Even though I haven't talked about um, you know, 
implications on young people's um, sexual and reproductive um, health, we do have um, overarching um, sexual and reproductive health policies that indirectly um, address some of the needs um, of the youth. So I don't, I don't know of a country that has addressed the entirety of the of the range of vulnerabilities that um, affect youth in a developing country setting. And if some of um, my colleagues on the panel have an idea, it would be great um, to share this. But I do know that there are you know relevant policies that different countries have that the youth could take advantage of. But I don't have of I don't have an idea of one country that has a comprehensive policy that addresses um, all of um, the, the youth's vulnerabilities. And I would go one step further and say that it's even more difficult to find some of these um, policies where they exist, um, catering to uh, specific needs of the different subgroups of the youth. So um, uh, I talked about the fact that some of the youth's experiences can vary along different dimensions. You know, you have the gender dimension, um, you have even the rural urban dimension, um, you have uh, differences with respect to even disability. Okay, so it's, I, I think that hopefully with the focus that we are seeing put on issues of the youth, perhaps we will see a lot more attention um, given to more comprehensive policies, given to more targeted policies, uh, but the short answer to your question, no. Uh, but then I think that there's that there is that there is there's hope and there is promise. So I invite anybody else with, with any other contributions to please uh, weigh in on this. Thank you very much, Monica. Thank you. Uh, so let's move to the final uh, part of this this uh, session. We still have ten minutes, and Anastasia, Gage, and I we are very curious to. <laughs> And I'm sure all, everyone in this session are very curious to hear what you have to, to tell us about uh, the digital divide before and after the pandemic. Joyce, would you like to go first? Now here, uh, we have uh, some initiatives that the government send. Uh, equipments, computers, or plans for internet, but uh, just because the pandemic. And now with the return to presidential um, classes, uh, we don't know if we will continue or not, but uh, during the pandemic, yes, we have uh, some programs for distribution of computer and internet for a specific time. But are you talking about the university or about uh, high, uh, high, uh, like younger university, kids? University and in the schools, uh, some uh, states, because the, the education here is not centralized, each state is responsible for your uh, student population. So uh, some states give the, this program. Others uh, learn uh, teaching uh, using television, and the students make exams uh, on distance, uh, uh, making in paper and send to a, a professor or a teacher. Some states use television, yes, and others uh, use programs of distribution of computers and internet. And overall, is there already studies? Are there already studies on the digital divide and the, if it decreased due to the pandemic or not yet? Uh, specifically in this time of pandemic, and now with the return to to presential uh, classes, we don't have the the continuation of this program. It's just uh, in the moment of the pandemic. Oh, I see. What about you, Nikechi? What is happening in Africa? So, um, thank you very much um, for the question. So I think that um, the COVID-19 pandemic um, certainly um, exacerbated that uh, digital divide. And if you look at um, what was happening even between 
um, or sorry, even within um, countries. So um, in many um, uh, developing countries, that is in Africa, for example, you saw that you know once the COVID-19 pandemic struck, and we saw a lot of students being moved um, out of the classroom and encouraged to sort of try to learn using you know the radio or TV or their tablets. We certainly saw a difference. Um, with respect to students' access um, to these facilities? Well, because in, uh, in, 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 in many parts of the country, in rural areas, for example, you don't have electrification, okay? So you don't even have electricity to be able to watch TV um, uh, and pick up on all these um, learning uh, uh, materials or lessons. But in urban areas, on the other hand, you had children um, who were a little bit more advantaged because they had access to that. We talk about electricity and also access to the internet. Okay, so students who resided in particular parts of the country with little access to electricity and internet, you saw were left behind. Right? So we had a lot of students who actually could not go to school, could not benefit from some of these educational programs and, and interventions that we saw. You can also even think about it from the, even within the urban centers. Okay, you can look at, we saw a digital divide with respect to public and then private schools. Okay, so we saw that a lot of public schools did not, were not uh, adequately set up. Um, with what they needed to be able to teach their students virtually, even within uh, uh, the urban setting. It took some time for them to actually, um, you know, get on board with the program. Private schools, on the other hand, had little difficulty. Um, so you had, um, and I, I wonder if that is also linked to the socioeconomic backgrounds um, of students. So we saw that um, private uh, students in private schools oftentimes were from well-to-do um, households. They could afford the tablets and the laptops, while other students who were in public schools perhaps were not um, so um, as well endowed. So we certainly saw a difference in that in that respect. So I think that yes, already um, before this, we didn't have a lot of experience, you know, with uh, uh, virtual learning and all of that. But once the pandemic hit, it became even more pronounced. And we saw even within country, um, within uh, geographical location differences in how uh, in, the, in the access to these virtual learning facilities um, between students. So I would say that, yes, it certainly played a very large um, role. In some cases, you even had women, um, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, you know, have to leave their jobs to try to uh, teach teach their little ones to try to get them, you know, set up, found a way. There were situations where some women would borrow mobile phones and have their children try to follow the lesson on a mobile phone for as long as the internet credits lasted. You know, so it was, it was a lot of things to try to adapt, but I think that certainly we saw an exacerbation of that digital divide, even if not between countries, certainly within country, we did see that. And thank you very much for the question. Thank you, Nketi. Uh, Dominique, I'm sorry, but you have one minute. Yes, I, I'm just going to agree with what Nketi said. And you might think as a white European man, I have no idea about internet in Africa, but I do because I was hosting a different event about this uh, last year. So uh, in, in Europe, it's the same situation. We have uh, a, a big divide, mostly within countries, not necessarily between countries. But uh, you might be surprised to hear that, you know, the, the minimum standard for uh, connection speeds in Spain is 300 uh, megabit per second, whereas in Germany, uh, I think the minimum is still 7 or 10 megabit per second. And it costs exactly the same uh, amount. So that's a huge uh, divide. Uh, and then, of course, it depends on if you're looking at Berlin City or if you're looking at uh, rural areas outside. And in Africa, you have the same kind of situation between countries as well. So if you look at Sudan, it's less than a dollar per gigabyte of, of uh, internet consumption. If you look at Nigeria, it's below uh, $5. And if you look at uh, Equatorial Guinea, it's about $35 per, per gigabyte. So that's a huge difference. And, and it shows you how important it is in the pandemic has shown us in particular how important it is to be connected 
because if you're not connected, you're going to lose out. You're going to lose out on your education, on information, on learning, and you're going to lose out also on opportunities to connect. And we all know it's not just the skills you have, it's also the network you have uh, in order to advance in life. And that's why connectivity is important and why we need to equalize access to connectivity. Well, then, thank you so much uh, to our three uh, speakers of this session. I'm very, very grateful. And I have learned a lot. I hope our colleagues here in the audience as well. And uh, these presentations will then be available on YouTube afterwards. So there'll be a chance for many others to learn with you. Uh, so thank you so much. We will ha now have a 15 minute break and then we'll have an, the final session of the Berlin Demography Days. Thank you so much. Bye bye.